Hello and a warm welcome to the video. Today I'm talking about this book called The Praise of Money by Richard Barnfield, graduate in Oxford, published in 1598. I've called the video Richard Barnfield New because it is part of a long series which you'll find in a playlist on my channel called Who Knew? These are among the titles that are there already, and each of them shows a contemporary of William Shakespeare who writes about William Shakespeare in a somewhat cryptic way, and all I have done is to scratch beneath the surface to show that every one of these people knew that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym being used by the poet and playwright, the Earl of Oxford, and that a large number of them, those I've circled in red, also knew that the Earl of Oxford was embroiled in a terrible scandal. This is the scandal that is mentioned rather elliptically in Shakespeare's sonnets, published in 1609, but those sonnets, of course, written towards the early to mid part of the 1590s. The scandal, as anyone who has looked at some of these parts already will know, uh, concerns not only the near bankruptcy of the Earl of Oxford, which wasn't a very dignified thing, but also the fact that he desperately wanted an heir to the Earldom of Oxford, and with honey tongue he persuaded his young friend, Henry Rosalie, Earl of Southampton, to sleep with his erstwhile mistress, Lady Penelope Rich, and to beget an heir, so that Henry de Vere, who later became the 18th Earl of Oxford, was in fact the natural son of Henry Rosalie by Penelope Rich. So he had no right really calling himself the 18th Earl of Oxford and calling himself Henry de Vere. That's the great scandal, and as I've shown in some of the other presentations, a lot of the poets at the time were very obsessed with this scandal, and they were all writing poems which allude to it. Barnfield is no different. He calls this the encomium of Lady Pecunia, or the praise of money. Now, there's nothing particularly strange about having two titles separated by the word or, but I think that here Barnfield is being sly and clever. He is encouraging his reader to read this poem in one of two ways, either as a simple praise of money or as an encomium of Lady Rich, Penelope Rich. Of course, the word pecunious means rich. And Barnfield himself says in this book, I have given pecunia the title of a woman, both for the termination of the word and because, as many women are, she is loved of men. Well, there was no uh, woman in the time of Barnfield who was more loved of men than Lady Penelope Rich. So this is all part of his obsession with her. I say obsession because if you go back four years, Barnfield published his first book, The Affectionate Shepherd, containing the complaint of Daphnis for the love of Ganymede. Now, when you read this poem, The Affectionate Shepherd, it's not very difficult to discover who the real-life Daphnis is. I say it's not difficult because the dedication is signed Daphnis, so Daphnis is obviously the poet himself, Richard Barnfield. And notice who he dedicates this book to, to the right excellent, most beautiful lady, the Lady Penelope Rich described at least four times as beautiful. And so when you read the poem, it again is not very difficult to ascertain that the character in it, described as Fair Lady Gwendolyn, Queen of Beauty, is representing Penelope Rich. She is involved in a sort of love triangle, very similar to the one that's described by Shakespeare in the sonnet. And that triangle involves a young boy with a long love lock, just as Henry Rosalie had, who's only called Ganymede, but not difficult to discover that Ganymede is Henry Rosalie, who is also beloved in a rather homosexual way of Daphnis, and that there is an older man who is a lord and a poet who gets in the way of all this, much to the annoyance of Daphnis. And if you read the poem, you'll realise quite quickly that he is... Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. So this is all about the scandal. If you look at the later poem, four years later, The Praise of Lady Pecunia, you can see a certain technique that Barnfield uses to draw attention to what he's really saying, as opposed to what he appears to be saying. He begins this poem to Lady Pecunia, I sing not of Angelica the Fair. Go back four years to his dedication to Penelope Rich, and he starts fair, lovely lady whose angelic eyes, a little pointer 
uh, in the later poem that he is talking about Penelope Rich, as indeed when he discusses her in the dedication as one who converts joy to pain and pain to pleasure. And four years later, he writes of Lady Pecunia, who dost convert the saddest mind to mirth. Same thing, of course, as converting pain to pleasure. You will remember uh, those who have seen a previous presentation of Philip Sidney, who talks uh, of Penelope Rich as Stella and writes about how she alone is the one who can make his muse speak. Here we have you, you alone can make my muse speak, something that was picked up by other poets and slightly mocked, I think. Gervais Markham writing to Penelope Rich, but you, oh you, you that alone are you, something that uh, Shakespeare seems to find amusing in his 84th sonnet, which can say more than this rich praise that you alone are you, with all the hints that he's talking to Penelope Rich laid around about it. Hope you don't think I'm going too fast through these things, but they are things that I have um, already presented to you, so they're acting more as reminders. Back to Barnfield, I think the, the cheekiest and naughtiest bit of it comes at the end, as you often get at the end of a, a poem. This is at the end of his dedication to Penelope Rich. Remember that Penelope Rich seems to have given birth to a baby, only to give it away, to be brought up as Henry Vere. And Barnfield has the absolute audacity to end his dedication. Then, noble lady, take in gentle worth this newborn babe, which here my muse brings forth. Extremely cheeky. Uh, he wasn't the only person to, of course, write about this. In a play called Cleopatra, Samuel Daniel writes about the wailing sorrow of giving away a bastard child, all, again, pointing at Penelope Rich. Um, OK, also in the earlier book, that's The Affectionate Shepherd, the 1594 book, is this poem called The Complaint of Chastity, briefly touching the cause of the death of Matilda, the stories at large written by Michael Drayton. Michael Drayton was a great friend of Richard Barnfield's, and it seems odd in this book dedicated to Penelope Rich that you should have this violent attack on unchastity, on women who sleep around, tying it in to Matilda, because, of course, Michael Drayton's poem of Matilda also alludes to Penelope Rich and compares her not only to the uh, Rosamond of Samuel Daniel's poem, but also to Lucrece in Shakespeare's poem. He talks of her acting her passions on our stately stage and in our sainted legendary placed by him who strives to stellify her name. Talking, of course, there about Philip Sidney, who turns Penelope Rich's name to Stella in his Astrophil and Stella sonnets. Also in this early Barnfield book, The Affectionate Shepherd, in fact the last poem in the book, we get Helen's Rape, and uh, once again we can see the connection between this and the great scandal that was going on in court at the time, particularly with reference to the, the beautiful young youth, the boy, Paris, and an older Earl who rhapsodises on the beauty of a married woman. This he spake, and I'm quoting, this he spake to entice the mind of a lecherous young man who heard him hard and gave good ear to his hearkening so that his lust was turned to a fire, fire was turned to a flame, and flame was turned to a burning brand. This idea of a, a honey-tongued lord who persuades a younger man to go to bed with someone else, we get it in Lucrece, when Collatine, the husband of Lucrece, whets the appetite of the lecherous young Tarquin by describing the great beauties of his wife, Lucrece. Uh, the same thing also happens in Daniel's Rosamond when a matron persuades the young Rosamond to go to bed with the older king. So this figure of the honey-sweet persuader, uh, which represents de Vere in all these poems, is once again here in the poem Helen's Rape. So you can see that Richard Barnfield, very much obsessed with the great scandal of court at the time. I'm showing you now a picture of a map of England, and I'm pointing to Staffordshire. Uh, the reason for that is to bring the connection between Penelope Rich and Richard Barnfield. Penelope Rich's family home, Chartley Manor, is right there in Staffordshire. It's actually marked as Chartley Castle, but that was pulled down and Chartley Manor was built by her father. 
and that is about four and a half miles from the county town of Stafford. And if you go through Stafford, about uh, seven or eight miles further on, you come to Norbury Manor, which is where Richard Barnfield was brought up. If I show you both the houses, that's uh, Chartley Manor, the Deverooks house of Penelope Rich, and that's Norbury Manor, where Richard Barnfield was brought up. So you can see both families belong to the what we call the county gentry. They both have similar style, rather smart, gentrified houses. And they certainly knew one another. In fact, we have records of land dealings between the Deverooks family and the family of Scrimshire. I say Scrimshire because Richard Barnfield's mother died early, so he was actually brought up in this house by his aunt, Elizabeth Scrimshire. But I'm guessing that it was through Barnfield's connection, Staffordshire connection, with the Deverooks family that he was introduced to court, and that is, of course, how he would have known Henry Rosalie and, and also would have got to know about the great scandal of which we speak. OK, all of that perhaps is by way of some sort of introduction to what we really want to talk about, which is Richard Barnfield's comments on Shakespeare. So it comes in this poem right towards the end of the book in Praise of Money, and the poem begins Liv Spencer, and there are three further verses beginning and Daniel, and Drayton, and Shakespeare. Very odd to say Liv Spencer, Liv Daniel, Liv Drayton, Liv Shakespeare, because all of them were alive at the time of the book's publication. Odd as well, you might think, to call the poem a remembrance of some English poets. You don't normally talk about a remembrance, sounds a bit like a recollection, when you're talking about poets who are still alive and no doubt even living in the same town as you are when you're writing this poem. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. The question of why you're asking the poets to live when they're all alive is actually answered if you read the immediately preceding poem where Barnfield writes, Chaucer is dead and Gower lies in grave. The Earl of Surrey long ago is gone. Sir Philip Sidney's soul the heavens have. George Gascoigne, him before was tombed in stone. So there he mentions four dead poets which seem to uh, counterbalance, if you like, with the next poem in which he's talking to four living poets. And here he goes on, Yet though their bodies lie full low in ground, as everything must die that erst was born, their living fame no fortune can confound, nor ever shall their labours be forlorn. So what he's saying quite simply is, although these four poets are dead, their fame shall live on uh, in their works. And that is precisely what he seems to be saying, when we get to these living poets, he's saying, although you're still alive, let your fame live on forever in the works you have written. So he starts, Live, Spencer, ever in thy fairy queen, whose like for deep conceit was never seen. Crowned mayst thou be unto thy more renown as king of poets with a laurel crown. That all sounds fairly straightforward, fairly simple, but I would like to draw your attention to the little phrase in brackets about Spencer, for deep conceit. That phrase was used just two poems earlier, a couple of pages back. Also talking about Spencer. Spencer to me, whose deep conceit is such as passing all conceit, needs no defence. He's used exactly the same phrase about Spencer twice. Deep conceit. Now what is going on here? Is Barnfield such an unimaginative poet that he can only think of these two words when discussing Spencer? Or is he deliberately using deep conceit twice because he wants the reader of the poem about Spencer, Daniel, Drayton and Shakespeare to look at this poem and wonder what is the connection between the two? Well, as we are always learning, Tudor poets are very smart and very clever. And needless to say, he wants you to go back and look at this poem and rethink it a bit. Now, many of you will recognise it straight away. If music and sweet poetry agree, as they must needs, the brother and the sister, then must the love be great, twixt thee and me. This is a poem that we normally attribute to William Shakespeare, by W. Shakespeare. Now, the title page I've got showing here is dated 1599, but we know that there was an earlier edition, and unfortunately the only copy of that earlier edition that exists uh, is lacking a title page it doesn't have a date on it but we think the first edition may be 1596 1597 something like that this is the second edition and there was a third edition in 
1612. But the point being that this poem seems to be by Shakespeare, although Barnfield doesn't actually say it's by Shakespeare. So actually it's confused a lot of uh, modern scholars, who, some of whom ascribe it to Barnfield. It is entitled here to his friend, Master R.L. Two things I will say about that. If it were by Barnfield, would he not say to my friend, Master R.L.? particularly since this poem is written in the first person. It talks about I and me, so you'd expect the title to say to my friend. It doesn't. It says to his friend, as though the person who wrote the title is distancing himself from the actual writing of the poem. And dedicated to R.L. Uh, those of you who have seen a previous presentation I put online about uh, William Covell's Polymantea will know that R.L. were the initials that appeared on a set of poems called the Diella Sonnets, and that William Covell tells us rather discreetly that the R.L. sonnets are by Henry Rosalie, the Earl of Southampton. So it seems that this Shakespeare poem is written to the Earl of Southampton. Just looking briefly at what he says about Spencer... Spencer to me, whose deep conceit is such as passing all conceit, needs no defence. This seems to me to be an allusion to Spencer's Fairy Queen, in which he writes a poem to the Earl of Oxford saying, Please, Earl of Oxford, defend me against envy, against envy's poisonous bite, is how he put it. And the Earl of Oxford replies in a poem saying, No, no, you don't need any defence uh, from envy. Your poems are too good for that. I say this poem is by the Earl of Oxford. It's actually signed Ignoto, meaning the unknown. But many believe that Ignoto is another pseudonym used by the Earl of Oxford. Certainly there's a poem signed Ignoto in a book called England's Helicon, published in 1600, called My Flocks Feed Not. And that is also published under the name William Shakespeare in The Passionate Pilgrim of 1599. And there's another uh, ignoto poem in Peace Cod Time, which you can find in a contemporary manuscript, uh, which is assigned to the Earl of Oxford. So I think quite an interesting little aside there. Another aside, very important, look at this last two lines. One God is God of both, i.e. God of music and of poetry. One night loves both, and both in thee remain. Now, why do I bring that up? It's because Shakespeare here is calling himself a knight. Um, he says he loves both music uh, and uh, singing, particularly when they're put together, as he says in the line just above it, and both in the remain, i.e. in Henry Rosalie. Why is Shakespeare calling him self a knight. This is something that causes terrible, terrible problems for the Stratfordian scholars because Shakespeare of Stratford, Shakespeare of Stratford, is no knight. And they tried to get out of it, of course, by assigning this poem to Barnfield, but Barnfield wasn't a knight either. So either way, you're in terrible trouble. Of course, Edward de Vere was, as we know from William Byrd, his Law of Nobility, published in 1658, where he talks about a writ addressed by the king to the Earl of Oxford. And he writes about that. Uh, the writ is to the Earl of Oxford greeting, not naming him knight, though he be a knight, and though that degree be parcel of his name. So again, great problems for Stratfordians. Shakespeare calls himself a knight. Well, those of us who've been concentrating know exactly why. Okay, I'm sorry, because I seem to have gone on quite a long peroration there. Let's look at the second verse of this. Uh, and Daniel... Praised for thy sweet, chaste verse, whose fame is graved on Rosamond's black hearse. Remember, Rosamond is the poem by Daniel dealing with the great scandal. Still mayst thou live and still be honoured for that rare work, the white rose and the red. This is curious, because Daniel didn't actually write any work called the white rose and the red. He did, however, write a work published in 1595 called The First Four Books of the Civil Wars Between Two Houses of Lancaster and York. And as we know, the symbols of the Houses of Lancaster York are a white rose and a red. So you might well think that that is what he's talking about, that rare work, The White Rose and the Red. But if he is talking about that, why does he give it the wrong title? Why doesn't he just say... Still mayst thou live and still beget applause for that rare work, thy book of civil wars. Makes the point very, very clearly, and you don't need to pretend that he wrote something that he didn't write. But no, he wrote that work, The White 
rose and the red. And you have to ask himself why he's doing that. Certainly it reminds me of a contemporary poem by John Weaver, entitled Venus here. Sits Venus naked, holding in her hand a tumbling shellfish with a myrtle wand, wearing a garland on her wimpled head, compacted of the white rose and the red. The white rose and the red, of course, are symbols, not only the House of York and Lancaster, but they are symbols of venery, um, of lust, of Venus. And I think, therefore, we can start to look again at this title, A Remembrance of Some English Poets. Does that mean Barnfield is bringing to mind some English poets? Or is he actually talking about something that the English poets have set in remembrance, something that these poets have written about that will cause to be remembered for ever, i.e. the great scandal of which we're constantly talking about. I've already mentioned how, how Drayton uh, alludes to this scandal in his poem Matilda. Let's get on to, to Shakespeare then, and Shakespeare thou, whose honey-flowing vein Remember, Shakespeare is often described as honey-tongued, his ability to persuade being at the key to the great scandal. Whose honey-flowing vein, pleasing the world, thy praises doth contain. Whose Venus and whose Lucrece, sweet and chaste, thy name in fame's immortal book hath placed. This phrase, sweet and chaste, where have we seen that before? Again, we've seen it just two verses up. Daniel praised for thy sweet, chaste verse. Again, I ask, is Barnfield such a limited poet that he can only think of one phrase to describe things? Of course not. He uses sweet and chaste and sweet chaste both times deliberately. He is trying to get the reader to see the connection between Venus and Lucrece and Daniel's poem Rosamond. Well, this connection was already made for us by William Covell and it was made by Drayton as well. Uh, thy name in fame's immortal book have placed. Now, there's something weird about this last verse, which you can probably just see at a glance. It appears to have two lines too many. Each of the verses, which is addressed to each of the poets, is four lines long, and each addresses the poet in the second person familiar form, the, thy. Now we get at the end of the fourth verse this extra couplet, Live ever you, at least in fame, live ever. Well may the body die, but fame die never. So it would seem that this last couplet has changed the address from thee and thy to you because he is now talking to all of those poets together. He's talking to the community of Spencer, Daniel, Drayton and Shakespeare and rounding it all up by saying, live ever the lot of you, at least in fame. But is there another deeper meaning to this? I think you'll find that there is. Why, if he's now going to address all four of the poets, does he not disconnect from the Shakespeare verse and write four lines to all four? Why does he ram up this couplet against the, the four lines to Shakespeare? Is he trying to create some sort of a connection? Let's look at the fourth line where he uses infames and the first in the couplet where he uses infame. He's pulling those two together. What does infame mean? Well, if we go to the Oxford English Dictionary, you can see it means infamous, infamy, an infamous person, one branded with infamy, to render infamous, to brand with infamy or dishonour, to hold up to infamy, to reprobate. So clearly uh, he is trying to draw some connection uh, between Shakespeare and infamy. If you count the lines, you'll find that this couplet begins on the 17th line. You'll also see live ever, that word ever, is the 17th word from the end. He is drawing us into the connection then between Shakespeare and E. Vere Ever, the 17th Earl of Oxford, and his connection to infamy. Live E. Vere. You, at least in fame, live ever. Well may the body die, but fame die never. Fame, of course, also can mean infamy. He is basically saying, you will live through your vile, reprehensible 
actions and he's being extremely rude to Shakespeare. And this seems to be outing him as the 17th Earl of Oxford, E. Vere. So if Barnfield here is deliberately using that last couplet to talk to Edward de Vere and linking him to Shakespeare in the previous four lines, how do we account for the change of address from thee and thy to you? Well, actually, that's quite simple. A pseudonym would be addressed as thee, thy. In fact, there's a poem by Drayton where he discusses lots of different poets, and the only one he addresses by the second person from familiar the thy is Shakespeare, again indicating that that is a pseudonym. Of course, when you're talking to a superior to the Earl of Oxford, you would have to address him as you in the formal second person. As a contemporary reference book at the time says, thou from superiors to inferiors is proper as a sign of command. From equals to equals is passable as a note of familiarity. But from inferiors to superiors, if proceeding from ignorance hath a smack of clownishness, if from affectation a tang of contempt. So from an inferior to a superior, you would address him as you. So the clever thing that Barnfield has done here is to make that change of address, to give that sense of Shakespeare as two people, as Shakespeare the pseudonym and as Shakespeare the real Shakespeare, the infamous Shakespeare, who is E. Vere, the Earl of Oxford, addressed as you. Now, as I've said, poems in anthologies connect. It is the great crime, the besetting sin of Shakespearean scholars. They never, ever bother to look what comes before, what goes after, and ask why does it come before, why does it go after. Now, here we find this reprobation of Shakespeare, the Earl of Oxford, as an infamous person is followed by an ode as it fell upon a day in the merry month of May and yes once again I'm sure you all recognize that as by Shakespeare and belonging again to the book The Passionate Pilgrim. Why has it been put here? Just before I look at the poem and explain exactly why it's been put here something I left out. This little group of poems appears at the end of the book in Praise of Money, and it has its own little title page. And that title page is called Poems in Diverse Humours. And you'll notice that on that title page, there is no By Richard Barnfield graduate in Oxford. That only appears on the front title page, The Praise of Money. But of course, it's led people to assume that everything, even in the back here, is by Richard Barnfield. So why does he call it Poems in diverse humours. Well, as we've seen, this last little group of poems contains two that are actually by Shakespeare, one that is about Shakespeare, another that uh, alludes to Penelope Rich, and so it is pretty obvious to those of us of an Oxfordian mindset that poems in diverse humours is actually punning with poems in de Vere's humours, and humour, of course, being in de Vere's style, character, whatever you like. Um, so he is already giving you a clue on the title page that he is talking about de Vere. OK, why does this poem by Shakespeare follow from this insult to Shakespeare about his infamy? The poem is written in the first person, just like the other Shakespeare poem in this anthology, the only two poems that were written in the first person. And in it, the poet listens to a nightingale. Fie, 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 now would she cry, teru, teru, by and by, that to hear her so complain, scarce I could from tears refrain, for her griefs so lively shown, made me think upon my own. Those of you who know the two gentlemen of Verona will recognise a great similarity there between what Shakespeare writes here can I sit alone, unseen of any, and to the nightingale's complaining notes tune my distresses and record my woes. So exactly the same thing in this poem. Uh, Shakespeare uh, listening to the nightingale and tuning his woes. What are his woes? He says, thou and I were both beguiled. Every one that flatters thee is no friend in misery. Words are easy like the wind. Faithful friends are hard to find. Every man will be thy friend whilst thou hast wherewithal to spend. But if store of crowns be scant, no man will supply thy want. 
So he's complaining about the fact that he's run out of money and thereby lost his friends. Exactly the same as Shakespeare writes in Timon of Athens, a whole play about a rich, generous patron who runs out of money and finds all his fickle friends turn against him. It's exactly, of course, what happened to Edward de Vere. Great, great problem, as always, for the Stratfordians. There's absolutely no evidence that Shakespeare Stratford ran out of any money. In fact, he seemed to have got richer and richer until his dying day. The poem goes on, and here I've, I've used the version from The Passionate Pilgrim. If he be addict to vice, quickly him they will entice. If to women he be bent, they have at commandment. But if fortune once do frown, then farewell his great renown. They that fawned on him before use his company no more. So I hope it's very clear to you now why this particular poem has been placed by Barnfield's accusations of Shakespeare, Vere and his infamy. This is a poem by Shakespeare, Vere explaining how his um, addiction uh, to vice, to women, to spending money, all came to nothing, how he lost all his friends through so doing. As one of Vere's, uh, Oxford's contemporaries says, Henry Locke, in a letter to Lord Burley, he says how Oxford was brought to ruin by the over many greedy horse leeches that had sucked too ravenously on his sweet liberality. This is a very, very personal poem uh, by Oxford about his fall from grace. Do read it. Um, do please catch up with future updates by pressing the subscribe button. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you press the bell beside it, you'll be notified every time I upload something new. Thank you very much indeed for watching.